Welcome, everyone, to this episode of Beyond the Crucible. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the podcast and the communications director for Crucible Leadership. And we're welcoming you into a podcast that is about a subject that you probably know a little bit about if you've tuned in, and that is crucible experiences. And we define crucible experiences as those things in your life that are painful, traumatic, uh, upsetting. They can change the trajectory of your lives, failures and setbacks and things that happen to you and sometimes things that you yourself set into motion. But the reason that we talk about them here on Beyond the Crucible is not to sort of have a powwow where we just, you know, sort of tell war stories. The idea of talking about them is to highlight folks like our guests today who have been through crucibles and have bounced back from their crucibles and now they're on the other side living lives of significance and we talk about those individuals and we interview those individuals to give you hope on your road to healing on your own road to a life of significance and uh, with me as always um, i would not be here were he not here is warwick fairfax who is the founder of crucible leadership and the host of the show warwick um uh, We've got a great one today, and not only because the only American accent on the show today is going to be mine. <laughs> Absolutely. Very much looking forward to it. That listener was a reference to our guest, Ryan Campbell, who, when he speaks, you will realize, is uh, like Warwick, Australian. But here's a little bit more about Ryan. Few people have encountered the extreme polar opposites of success and tragedy that Ryan has, let alone by the age of 26. As the youngest person to fly solo around the world, Ryan's life changed in an instant following a very serious light plane crash. He survived against all odds and was admitted to a spinal rehabilitation ward as a complete paraplegic with no movement from the waist down. Ryan proved his mental fortitude as a record-breaking pilot, but demonstrated his mastery by learning to walk again and fighting his way back into the sky. The gamut of human experience led Ryan to develop his mindset toolbox and the three-step checklist to navigating change, ways of thinking that, allows, uh, that allow individuals and organizations to overcome adversity, navigate change, and build a better future. That's really what we're all about at Crucible Leadership. So take it away, Warwick. Ryan, it's uh, so great to have you on the podcast and um, love your story and your book, Born to Fly. Um, but before we get into uh, your Crucible and some of the amazing things you've done in flying, tell us a bit about Ryan Campbell, how you grew up, your family. Tell us a bit about yeah, yourself growing up in Australia. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, thanks, Warwick. I explain myself as just a normal Aussie kid. Uh, any more laid back, I'd be lying down. That is my <laughs> <laughs> that's my favourite overused line. I was I grew up not in a poor family, but not in a rich family. Just a standard middle class Australian uh, establishment. We uh, originated on a farm property, and then we moved down to the beach when I was about six years old. And I grew up by the uh, salty, uh, clear blue water and the golden beachy sands, which I now miss. But um, my dad was a, a truck driver. He was a farmer and he was a local milkman. And my mum was a stay-at-home mum. We had a family of five, two older brothers, and uh, a family, I suppose you could say, uh, much larger than that also. You know, grandparents and aunties and uncles and just an amazing upbringing, which the older I get, the more I value and appreciate. So a really cool upbringing. Uh, I was a young kid with a whole bunch of ideas that uh, mum and dad normally rolled their eyes at. And uh, <laughs> it were many of those ideas uh, just drifted away into the uh, atmosphere, but a few of them landed and, you know, resulted in some wild adventures, not just for myself and then my family, but for a whole bunch of people who were in, involved in our uh, little escapades. So it's um, just a normal Aussie kid is, is my favorite way to uh, talk about who I am. So uh, where did your sense of adventure come from? Was it, you know, your mom, dad or relatives? Because you're somebody that just likes doing things that other people don't normally do. 
I think the problem lies within me, to be honest. <laughs> the problem. <laughs> I, I have a family who love travel, but you know, we love to kind of see the world and a very uh, outside of the box thinking family. But I'm definitely the first person and still the only person who's really ventured out on anything super left of field like I, I did and, and continue to do. Uh, I've always been a very impatient kid. I always wanted more. I remember when I was a young kid, I used to unpack the dishwasher and ask for chores before school so mum could you know save some money for me so I could you know pocket money and buy things and I, I just when I wanted something it didn't matter what it was a piece of technology or you know an ice cream or a new cd or whatever I was that kid who just did not let go didn't matter whether my parents knew I would never use the product when it you know arrived in my hands but I've always been someone who is very fixated on a goal and I that I think in itself has led to to the adventures that were had. So I understand that you have, you know, wanted to fly or been fascinated by flying at the very earliest age. What was your first memories of this passion for flying? I think, so the first memory has attached to it a really cool business story to give you a little bit of an idea of my family. So my dad was a milkman, as I said, mom was stayed at home mom. We didn't have a lot of money, but we worked for a company in Australia where they had an incentive uh, program every year. Now, if we sold a certain amount of berry juice products, uh, we would get a free ticket overseas. So I remember at six years old uh, in a family that had never set foot outside of Australia, my parents bought a lot of juice. And like I'm talking, (laughs) we filled a storeroom with long life apple juice and orange juice. And what that led to was the first overseas trip to Vanuatu, an island in the Pacific when I was six years old. And we went on a business trip where we swam in the pool and they went to their little work events for a week. And it was an amazing getaway. And it was the only way my parents could afford to go overseas because they then come home from the holiday and spend the next six months selling orange juice to anyone with a, uh, a, a thirst to pay for that uh, adventure. So it was on that first overseas trip that was actually to be the first of four. So we're really uh, lucky young kids to get to travel. The first of four of these incentive trips uh, that I climbed into a Boeing 737 and we took off and being the youngest and the cutest of the three, which I always say, we, they put me by the window. I got the window <laughs> seat. And um, I sat there and watched uh, Sydney appear in the window of that aircraft as we took off. And everything about the experience, I was just blown away by. It was just simply magic to me. Uh, you know, the fact that everyone in Sydney uh, has a red roof on their on their house or exactly. uh, just the size of <laughs> Sydney or honestly, the biggest moment was the fact that we went through clouds. At six years old, you, I just didn't even believe you could reach the clouds, let alone do so over Sydney in an aeroplane. And uh, prior to September 11, uh, which shows how old I am, we uh, were invited up to the cockpit and I walked up there with both my brothers and I followed in trail and we met the pilots and we looked at the buttons and the switches. And from that point on, if honestly, Warwick, and you'll laugh at this being an Aussie, but I would always tell people three things from when I was six years old. One is that I wanted to be a jumbo jet pilot. I wanted to fly for Qantas. That was great. That was a solid dream that uh, lasted. The second was that I wanted to own a Subaru WRX, which was a big dream for a six-year-old. The third, for some reason, I wanted to live in Canberra. Uh, I don't know whether it was a small town kid just kind of like saw the glistening lights in the shopping centers, but I don't know. I would not live in Canberra if you paid me now. But no, it's, it's a pretty it's, quiet place for a capital city. There's not much going on. It definitely is. So I was a six year old kid with three big dreams. And the one that truly lasted was this discovery of passion. And that was aviation. And it honestly has taken me and provided the, the highest experiences of my life, the best, uh, the most positive experiences, but it's also taken me to the deepest and the darkest places. So it really has provided a roller coaster ride in a, a short period of time. So after that trip to Vanuatu and sitting in the cockpit and having this passion for flying, you told your mom and dad, okay, I want to be a pilot. What was their reaction to this dream of the six-year-old? Little did I know when I was six that, my granddad had actually, he'd, he'd just passed away, but he had been a pilot and uh, not professionally, but he'd been a private pilot. Little did I know my dad actually wanted to learn to fly. He'd always wanted to learn since he was a kid. Little did I know my uncle, who he didn't have a lot to do with, was a commercial pilot and owned a joy flight business uh, in Marimbula, the little town I grew up uh, on uh, the South coast of Australia there. And little did I know all of that, which just makes me believe that aviation's in my blood. 
Uh, so my family probably didn't take it as a shock. Uh, and as we grew older, that dream, as I said, you know, really was set in stone. It was getting to 14 years old and saying, all right, I need a plan. How am I going to work through school and, and learn to fly? Well, common sense at that point for a 14 year old kid said, you know what, you're going to need two things. You're going to need money and a lot of it. And you're going to need at least a driver's license before they'll let you fly an airplane. I was incorrect on one of those fronts. I definitely needed money, (laughs) but I was reading the local newspaper when I was 14 and I read an article about a kid who flew solo in an airplane on his own for the very first time on the day he turned 15. That was the Mm. first day he was legally allowed. And here I am at 14, not very good at math, but I was like, all right, no, I don't have very long. (laughs) If he can do it, why can't I? Well, that led to an after school job and that led to a weekend job and it led to uh, about, what was I earning? $50 to wash a truck and 45 at the supermarket. So I was earning around about, I think, $190 a fortnight or every two weeks. And a flying lesson for an hour was 180 So I actually funded my way through flight training throughout school. I went solo, much to my mum's uh, stress levels went through the roof. But um, I, I went solo on my 15th birthday, just like this kid in the article. And I had discovered what I could do with a goal and a little bit of hard work. And I had ignited this passion, not just to fly more, but to do everything I could at the youngest possible age. And uh, the adventure just, it sped up from there. That's amazing. So you have all the sort of unknown, maybe flying genes in there, or it's just amazing how, how, how these things happen. But so you had this dream of flying. When did this idea to uh, fly around the world uh, while he was still a teenager, at what point did that dream started to form? So I'd flown solo on my 15th birthday when I was 16, I turned 16. I passed a flight test that allowed me to take friends and family flying in a restricted area. I wasn't 17 yet, so I didn't have a driver's license. I couldn't drive a car on my own. So all my buddies at school who were older than me, we cut a deal with them and we said, all right, you drive me from school to the airport after school. I'll take you for a fly, but you've got to drop me home. And uh, so that was my deal throughout when I was 17. When, uh, when I was 16, sorry, when I was 17, I had a private pilot's license. Uh, and when I was 18, I had a commercial. So I really pushed for whatever I could uh, every time I become a year older. It was at 17 that I read an article. Again, I should stop reading articles, but <laughs> I read an article on a kid who was American, 23 years old, who'd broken the world record for the youngest person to fly solo around the world. And we're talking 2008, we're talking the prior world record being 37. So there really was no age record. And we're talking a time where more people had gone to space and flown solo around the world. So not a very common thing to take place. Well, here I was at 17, he was 23. And again, not very good at math. Knew I had six years to pull this off. And I decided I wanted to find out more, but I kept it a secret. So I did what any wannabe 17 year old teenager would do. And I Googled, how to fly solo around the world. And I found a website called earthrounders.com and I printed off all the information. I highlighted all the important parts and I hid it in my desk. I didn't want my mum, my dad, my brothers. I didn't want anyone to find it. I didn't want anyone to think that I was silly enough to Mm. believe this was possible. Were you afraid that they were going to try and talk you out of it or something? or judge me or laugh at me. And I have the most supportive family in the world. So it was a very irrational fear, but I thought they would potentially just laugh and go, what is this kid on? You know, like this is wild. And, but I read those articles over and over again. And, you know, there wasn't a lot to read given that not many people had actually done this. I got to the point where I wanted to know more. I wanted to know more than those articles, but how do you, what do you do at that point? Now my mum and dad couldn't help me. So I decided I'd contact a gentleman I'm sure you know uh, to some degree, uh, Dick Smith, an Australian entrepreneur, uh, businessman, uh, aviation adventure, previous round the world pilot. I decided I'd contact Dick Smith and I thought, well, he has the power to help me. He has the knowledge and he has some of the answers. And if he laughs at me and this doesn't happen, I don't cross paths with Dick Smith very often. So I'm not going to feel judged. And that's so, kind of amazing because Dick Smith, for U.S. audience, he owns an electronic store chain, kind of like Best Buy in a sense in the U.S. So, I mean, it, it's kind of everywhere. So he's very successful. See, so you reached out to Dick Smith, uh, his busy guy, very successful. And he, 
he responded. He did. And which is so amazing. <laughs> everyone says, How do you, how did you do that when you were 17? And I said, I just Googled Dick Smith's email address. He hates me telling anyone that, but I found five and I sent an email to all five. And um, I said, Dear Dick Smith, my name's Ryan Campbell. I've got 200 hours and I want to be the youngest person. I read that email now and just cringe. And he responded and he said to me, Ryan, he said, what you want to do is dangerous. It's very risky. It's hard. It's never been done before. And he listed all these bad elements to the adventure. But at the end, he said a few simple words. And, and this, this was all that mattered. He said, but it can be done. Go and find yourself a mentor. And if you find a mentor who tells me that you're the guy for the job, I'll support you. So I took that same email that I sent dear, to Dick and I crossed out dear Dick and I wrote dear Ken and I sent it to a guy called Ken and he was a, the second person to ever hear about this adventure. He'd flown around the world uh, with another pilot. He was an Australian based in uh, a little town called Bendigo. He agreed to be my mentor. So I went back to Dick Smith. All of a sudden I had a team of three. Everything was very exciting until I realized I had not told or asked my mum and dad yet at 17 years old. So we went down the road of uh, asking mum and dad. I washed the dishes one night, which I think helped. And I, uh, I said to, to mum and dad, hey, what would you think if I said that maybe potentially one day I might want to fly a small airplane solo around the world? And dad said, oh, you'd see some amazing things. And mum said, oh, wouldn't that just be a phenomenal experience? And I thought, here they are, my parents going, here's another idea this kid's got. You yeah. know. Well, then I sat the folder of emails down in front of them from Dick Smith. <laughs> <laughs> a, literally a name they'd grown up with. Right. And all of a sudden it wasn't a joke. Well, that started the two-year planning, training, fundraising adventure where I didn't just plan and train and prepare as a pilot, but we fundraised a quarter of a million dollars on a laptop computer uh, the same laptop that would go around the world to write the blocks, the same laptop that we would write the book on. And we pulled together a team uh, from literally uh, myself to what became a massive team and an industry who supported what was a history making adventure. So a really long two years, lots of fundraising, lots of lessons, lots of growing up for a young kid. But to raise 250,000 being at age 17 is amazing. Obviously, you know, your parents might've been nervous, but, they were supportive. You had a plan. I mean, not too many 17 year olds would come up with the plan and have the courage to just write to Dick Smith and the wisdom to seek mentors when it was suggested. I mean, you pursued a goal just, you know, all out, but with a lot of wisdom, it was sort of courage and wisdom. I mean, as you mm -hmm. reflect back, uh, I know there's a lot of lessons in your life, but those lessons leading up to that round the world flight, there are some key lessons for people and how you approached it. Absolutely. And for me, I, I always say courage and commitment, courage to take it on, commitment to see it through. And I learned so many lessons the hard way. And we could talk for, for days about the little <laughs> moments that I learned. And, you know, I was a kid who couldn't make his bed. And I was trying to contact the largest companies in the world through these very average, you know, sponsorship proposals where I'd stolen their logo, full copyright straight off the internet. And I started off and had to refine the process to find success. And, and we did find success from, you know, a deal with uh, 60 minutes and all sorts of large media outlets around the world. And, you know, what resulted not just in a successful adventure, but a book deal. And, you know, it was a phenomenal transformational time for a young kid to learn and grow even before we took off to fly around the world. I mean, that two years was, I think that more of the story lies in that two years than it does in the 70 days of, mm. of circumnavigating the globe. So that, and that was 2015, was it? When, when did the flight happen? That was 2013. 2013, okay, got it. And so that was, how long did it take to fly around the world, did you say? So I climbed into a rented single engine airplane and it was a four seat piston powered propeller plane. And I had 160 gallons of fuel in the cockpit with me in a big bag. And we could fly this airplane up to 16 and a half hours nonstop, you know, and that's what I needed to cross all these big ocean legs. And I took off at 19 years of age. After that two years of planning, we flew 24,000 nautical miles to 35 stops in 15 countries I took off from Wollongong, just south of Sydney, Australia on the East Coast. And I pointed that airplane northeast, purely over the Pacific Ocean. And I did not stop uh, until I made it to North America. I, I had about five uh, legs to get across the Pacific alone. The longest being Hawaii to California, 15 hours nonstop. Yeah. Uh, literally sitting in one little seat. So a very long trip in a very yeah, little airplane. Not a lot airplane. of margin for error on that one if you've 
very back. little margin for <laughs> error. There's there's some stories from that leg for sure. <laughs> so you did this remarkable journey in 2013, and um, that led to I think the book you wrote, Born to Fly. Was that written after that, but before? It did yeah. Uh, so yeah. the way that I explain the stories when we deliver keynotes is I I tell stories not from an ego point of view. I hate nothing more than ego or manufactured right. drama in life. And we tell these stories to give people uh, a little bit of an idea of how good life was at this point. So yeah. the round the world flight ended, we were on 60 minutes. Um, I was invited to meet the Royals and named one of Australia's 50 greatest explorers. And I wrote a book that my nan can tell you every page number of every spelling mistake in that entire book. And that's not a joke. <laughs> and um, we, we shared the story and the story spread and life was great. We did so many wonderful things, you know, Australia Day ambassador roles and just had the opportunity yeah. to see a story which originated as a silly idea in a 17 year old uh, kid's head spread and impact um, the world from everyone from, you know, six year old kids who wanted to maybe fly one day, like I did originally through to ex world war two spitfire pilots who were writing me letters, just absolutely blown away by the story. Yeah. My heroes of the world were reaching out to me. So my life was amazing. I was on the Australian speaking circuit and, um, I was flying for a living and, you know, speaking just to kind of subsidize the terrible pay that we get paid as pilots. And I, I could not argue with where I was at in life. Um, and then it all changed. Yeah. So. so life was going so well. You were talking about courage, commitment, go for your dreams, anything's possible, which is a great message. But then for whatever reason, the world or fate gave you another message, which you weren't planning on didn't really want so talk about that uh i guess it's 2015 that kind of that fateful day what happened well i was my six-year-old self wanted to not only fly jumbo jet but my dream was to fly for Qantas, our australian airline yeah following a speaking gig in canberra believe it or not uh <laughs> i was offered a job uh with Qantas link our regional Qantas airline and i turned it down because my dream was to fly Spitfires. I wanted to fly World War II fighters. You know, that oh. was my dream. And I wasn't going to gain the experience I needed to fly those rare airplanes through flying for an airline. Plus I was 20, you know, 21. I, <laughs> I, I needed to go and live a little bit more. And I turned down the job with the airline and I took a job flying vintage airplanes to build up the experience I needed and just to have a great, exciting living. So my job was to fly a biplane that was built in the 1930s up and down the coast of Australia uh, and do some aerobatics and a beautiful machine, very old, but beautiful. Um, my job was to take one passenger at a time flying and, and it was, it was simple. It was, but it was a very pleasurable job. And on the 28th of December, 2015, I got up and went to work just like any other day, no oceans to cross, no records to break. And we climbed into that airplane I had a gentleman in the front with me and uh, I was sitting behind him. He was also a pilot, very, very nice gentleman. And we started the airplane. Uh, you actually have to grab the propeller and spin the propeller with your hands and start it by hand. So it's a very old technology. And we taxied to the end of the runway. We lined up on this short grass airstrip nice and early in the morning to take off and go and look at the beach. And I pushed a power forward. The airplane performed beautifully and we lifted off the ground, the runway end uh, the fence at the end of the runway disappeared beneath the nose and straight away at about 150 feet over the top of trees the engine failed and we had a partial engine failure and within three seconds despite everything that i could do we just we had no i don't know what i ever could have done different we had nowhere to go and we ended up in what was a horrific plane crash and you it's just not explainable how bad it was and I was cut from the wreckage, placed into a, he a helicopter and flown to hospital, but I was the only survivor. And oh uh, I was taken to hospital in Brisbane. I was operated on immediately. I had shattered facial bones, five breaks in my back. My ankle was almost removed. My right ankle was shattered. And uh, I was operated on immediately. And I was awake for the accident and most of the ordeal blacked out from the pain and the impact for you know some minutes here and there. But... Overall, I remember every element of it. And I woke up in a recovery ward with no movement or feeling from my waist down. I was a complete paraplegic. So obviously a lot's going through your mind. I mean, you're an experienced pilot, even at that age, you're thinking, well, obviously I'm not a pilot, but if you're hundred feet up, the engine fails, 
the, you know, you've got no time to think of anything or do anything. And even if you could, it sounds like there was nothing you could do. So that's, was that like, well, certainly wasn't pilot error. There's nothing I could have done. It was the hardest part of this entire, especially with the outcome of the accident, the hardest part of this entire journey for me has been coming to mental grips with the outcome, what happened, why it happened, what could have been done, what was done and analyzing those number of seconds. And I know in my heart of heart that we made the best decisions on the day uh, in that moment, flying what we were flying. It was just, you know, if that engine had failed 10 seconds earlier or 20 seconds later, we would have been okay. But we, the devil himself pressed the button at that moment for me. And I don't know, you know, put me in a simulator and give me that a hundred times again. I don't know what I could have done differently with all the elements that, come into play when we consider you know an engine failure on takeoff especially in 1930s technology and do i regret being in the airplane that day no do i regret getting out of bed and not sleeping in no do i regret not having a flat tire and cancelling that flight no i i don't um we made the best decisions to be there that day and i don't know what i could have done different and that's my only way that I can come to grips with being the one who made it out as opposed to the one who did it. So obviously you go through that, you know, people talk about survivor guilt and all that. Why was it me? And that's probably one thing, not that it's fair, but we're human. I mean, logically you knew there's nothing you could have done. You asked us like, well, I could have given the engine another once over. I mean, it, even if you'd done that, probably it wouldn't have been that obvious without, I don't know what, you know, pulling every part of the engine apart even then you probably couldn't have found anything and it was they, they pulled it all apart and and we don't know you know and it could be anything from a mud wasp to a little bit of water we, we yeah. just don't have the so, so logically you know there's nothing you could have done but because we're emotional beings did it take a while for you to accept the fact there was nothing you could do like your your brain said i did everything i could but emotionally were you kind of beating yourself up a bit or i will always have that element in my life i always will that doesn't go away with time it gets easier with time you know i do not blame myself and i if i if i did i wouldn't be i I couldn't live with that right i however live with the struggle and the triggers that will always come from that ptsd whatever you want to call it i will have that forever and that's been hard and you have to go through that to fully understand that kind of trauma, um, you know, getting, so people have gone through those sorts of experiences will probably could, could um, understand better, but how did you, how did you get beyond that? Cause intellectually, it sounds like you came to terms with that pretty quickly because you're a pilot, you get it. You understood there was no room for error. It was bad luck. You know, as you said, you know, like, uh, 10 seconds earlier, 20 seconds later, I mean, it would have been radically different. But how, how did you find a way to, to bounce back from that experience and live a positive life rather than, you know, the alternative is, is just to say, well, that adventurous, free-spirited Ryan Campbell is no more. I'm just going to be safe, cautious, just, you know, not do much anymore. And I'm going to jump in before you answer that question, Ryan, because... You told me something when we talked before we started uh, recording the show um, that I think is, is a universal truth for anyone who's gone through a crucible. Uh, our listeners know well, you probably know well, Ryan, being from Australia, the, the crucible that Warwick went through, the, the takeover of the family media business, um, that, uh, that failed takeover, the, the, the slipping of the company after 150 years, into you know out of the family's hands a 2.25 billion dollar loss not ex- not at all the same thing as the physical trauma that you went through but emotionally speaking what could i have done differently what can i learn how do i get you know how do i bounce back those those experiences are universal with crucibles and what you told me when we talked um that speaks to Warwick's question about how you got through it you said this to me we find the tools in our low points to power better times. Uh, And I just wanted to kind of get that out there, that perspective out there, because I think our listeners will definitely identify with that as you answer the question, how did you do it? 
Hundred percent, and you know, I am really big on this idea of tools and building a mindset toolbox. I'm really big on adversity being an opportunity. You know, adversity alone is adversity, but adversity with the right tools to utilize it is opportunity. It's simple as that. You know, at 21 years old, I was lying in that hospital bed, going through what you're talking about, Warwick. This constant reflection of what happened. You know, trying to get my memory back, trying to pull the pieces together, trying to work with the right teams of people around me to to say, okay, what happened, and and get answers. And it was a really long process. That honestly, it's it's not as prevalent in my day-to-day life now you know almost five years on but I tell you what it lasted many years and it's been very hard and and there are times where it it comes back up again Uh, when we look at uh, that time in hospital I don't it was so hard in the beginning just to exist for me I would always tell people that I was at maximum capacity you could have walked in and told me that I'd lost a family member or you could have chopped off my leg or from a pain and a mental point of view, physical and mental, I was at capacity. You couldn't have done anything more to me to make it any worse. But we started to crawl out of that hole with the real stink or swim mentality. And I remember sitting next to an Australian, I had many people from Alan Jones and all these incredible Australians that uh, the US audience might not be too familiar with, but trust me when I say incredible, incredible humans spending a lot of time with me at hospital. I remember sitting across from Paul de Gelder, an Australian Navy clearance diver who lost his arm and leg in a shark attack in Sydney Harbour. And he looked at me and he said, sink or swim. Now I'd spent an hour and a half with an ex Australian Wallabies coach. I had been to every psychologist known to man and ended up telling them how they felt. You know, I, I can't tell you how much help I had. But those three words changed everything for me because when I looked at Paul, I knew that at one point in his life, he had to actually swim and he chose to swim. And if we look at you know, this uh, crossroad we come to when we experience adversity or change, challenge or crisis in our life, we have to make a choice. It's up to us. A lot of tough love is needed. A lot of harden up is needed. We have to sit back. We have to make our own decision to sink or swim sinking is a very long and slippery slope to suicide. And I am really blunt about that because I'm really big on, you know, young people losing their mental battle. Swimming is the journey that we take to climb back up, to climb the mountain that's ahead of us, to get out of where we are, to end up in a better place physically and mentally. And if it's just one step at a time, that's okay. When I was in hospital, I was battling the mental aspect of the accident. What happened? Why? What could have been done differently? I was battling my physical state i had no movement from you know my waist down no feeling my bodily functions had uh disappeared i had no control i was a newborn baby in a hospital my dignity was left at the door when they wheeled me in and i spent the next six months in that spinal rehabilitation ward determined to not walk but fly and walking was merely a stepping stone on the way back to flying and that was the end of the conversation for me i was naive and i thought honestly, for that first 12 months that I was just going to get better. I mean, how naive can you be? I flew around the world. I was like, I'm going to be fine. And whilst I saw progress and I I released a video on this yesterday and I talked about progress uh, being the antidote to stress induced uh, or to change induced stress and how progress, even just a little bit of progress every day towards our end goal provides uh, purpose to the pain. So for that first 12 months, especially that first six months in hospital, I went from a complete paraplegia with no movement or feeling from the waist down, a wheelchair that was custom built for my body to a human who was walking, albeit I looked like I'd just sunk a bottle of uh, Tennessee whiskey, but walking. And that was a very long journey of pain, but with a lot of progress. I would see a twitch of a muscle, a little bit of sensation come back on some Uh, area of my lower body and all of these things were happening every day when i got to that 12 month point where my recovery started to plateau that lack of uh repair that that reduced rate of repair become one of the biggest challenges of my life because now it wasn't about okay just keep doing what you're doing you are going to be okay it was like okay this is it this is where I'm going to get to it. This is my new normal. We're going to have to start to get used to it, learn how to maintain it. And now I'm going to have to begin to adapt in my day-to-day routines to make sure that I can do as much of what I did in my previous life with these new injuries 
and I still have a whole bunch of things wrong with me, like a long list of things wrong with me. No calf muscles, no glute muscles. I have no feeling where I sit, no feeling on the backs of my legs, no feeling in my feet, very little control in my feet, no, no ability to push. I walk around on my heels all day, every day, no bladder control, no internal bodily functions whatsoever. But I walk and I just look like I've had a bad night on the town. But that journey as a whole, you know, we talk about, I mean, I, I speak purely on how did you get back up? How did you swim? What were all the elements of that? It all boiled down to building a toolbox. My overwhelmed state in the beginning of my time in hospital, uh, parents, brothers, cousins, doctors, uh, you know, Alan Jones, incredible humans, shark attack survivors, all, they were all giving me advice, advice on how to climb the mountain ahead of me. But it was too much. I, I had to take that crazy amount of advice. I had to take my overwhelmed state of mind and I had to somehow turn it into clarity. And that's where the mindset toolbox was born. Uh, my simple way born in hospital to take the moments I was experiencing moments that were easily forgettable to turn those moments into tools, tools that I could use to navigate change, challenge crisis and adversity and place them in my mindset toolbox, basically an unforgettable draw that I have access to 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the tools that I was going to use to climb the mountain. Wow. I mean, that's just an amazing journey, amazing story. Just for listeners, um, Alan Jones, you know, former coach of the Wallabies, that's Australia's national rugby team, you know, kind of a big deal, certainly in, uh, in Sydney and uh, in Queensland where rugby is pretty prevalent. Um, but you mentioned early on that, um, that uh, former diver says sink or swim. And it feels like that was a binary choice. It wasn't just plateau or lead a quiet life. It was sink might've been depression, suicide. I mean, it, who knows what sink would have been. I mean, it's scary to even contemplate. So it was like either swim or improve or the alternative is, is, is very dark and almost unthinkable. I mean, that that's, I think a lot of listeners wouldn't think about it that way, that sink or swim, you either rise or you fall into oblivion. I mean, it was that clear back then in the depths. It was, yeah. And I think it has to be that clear. And when I first started the the two-year process of planning the round the world flight, I had a team of five people. No one else knew about it, not even my extended family. I had a flying instructor who sat down with me, the very man who taught me to fly, Big Al. And he said to me, you going to do this or not? And I said, well, I just don't know. You know, one day I think I should, the next day I don't know whether I should and I just don't know. And he said, look, zoom out and have a look at the big picture, where you are in life, what you are trying to achieve, how bad you want to do it. And then we're going to make a yes or no decision on whether you even attempt this round the world flight. If you make a yes decision, you are going to work unbelievably hard every single day until you get to the point where it is either A, is success or B, an absolute uh, failure that you just can't bring back. Or you're going to say no, walk away and never look at it again. That yes or no decision is binary, as is the sink or swim decision. And I think we have to be clear in order to move forward and combat the mental... Me I mean, life is one and lost above the shoulders. That's my deal, right? Right. We have to be binary. Otherwise, we just get buried. So talk about, So almost what I'm hearing you say is that uh, two-year preparation for the round-the-world flight, um, you know, are we going to do it? Are we going to not? it almost in some sense prepared you for that next round the world journey in a sense that next, you know, epic, but tragic adventure, which was, you know, getting back uh, from that horrific accident. Do you look back and say that that kind of helped prepare me in some strange way? Without a doubt, a hundred percent, but yes, a hundred percent. What I also say is that at 21, I was lying in a hospital bed and I had experienced the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. So, Highs higher than most people would ever experience, mm -hmm. but lows lower than most people would ever experience. And it took a while for me to see it this way, but I started to view it as an opportunity. I'd been given an opportunity to compare. You know, we have mountain climbers, you know, as a keynote speakers, we have people out there who have done incredible things. We have people out there who have suffered uh, diversity, kind of, you know, adversity stories. We have those people as well. We don't have a lot of people who've experienced both, especially by that age. So what I was given was an opportunity to compare the highs and the lows and ask myself, where do we truly learn? Where do we grow? What makes me, me? And it was 
150%. Yes, I did pull things from the round the world flight. Yes, it prepared me for what was to come. But I truly become Ryan, the person I am today through the uh, adversity and the hard times in my life, for sure. And that's, that's sort of amazing thought of um, nobody wants adversity, but there are some lessons that, you know, who we are after a crucible is never the same as, as who we were before. Um, so yeah, I want to hear about the, you know, the toolbox that you've created, but yeah, talk a bit more about how there's some, it's going to sound very strange, but I don't want to say there's beauty in adversity, but there's certainly a lot of lessons in adversity that can, I don't know, maybe make us a better version, a more refined version of ourselves. I mean, what's your experience with that? I remember feeling so unbelievably sorry for myself, you know, which is what we all do as a reaction to, you know, negative change or adversity or crisis. And I was feeling down and I was in hospital with a whole bunch of reasons that probably allowed me to feel a little down at this point. And I remember that every day they would, they would hoist me off the bed in hospital. So they put a sling under me. It was a very uh, non-flattering kind of experience. And they'd lift me off the bed and they'd let me hang above that mattress until my body hurt so much that they'd just put me back down and let me rest. Every day we could hang for a little bit longer. And then they originally put me out of that bed into a wheelchair and they took me to the rehabilitation gym. That first trip to the rehabilitation gym changed my life. The gym was a place where quadriplegics and paraplegics were doing all they could to bring their bodies back to life and obtain uh, what I call our maximum potential, which is a really important word in what I speak about now. So I was taken to this rehabilitation gym and I was placed down on a low-lying mat, uh, slung, slung onto this mat. They told me my first challenge for the day was learning to roll over. Now, it was a whole lot harder the second time than it was the first time. But I remember loving a challenge and thinking, all right, like how can I go from my back to my stomach? You know, nothing works from the waist down, but I can do this. Well, I concocted a plan in my head and I thought if I could just lift one of my chunky legs up and lie it over the other leg and I could then lean over and grab the side of this bed and pull with my arms, I'm going to kind of untwist and I'll, I'll be not only lying on my stomach, but I'll be victorious in this first challenge. And I remember doing that, twisting my legs and then grabbing the side of that bed and pulling and as I pulled, the five breaks in my back and all the new titanium metalwork that I have just screamed in pain. Oh, no. So I stopped on my side and my right arm was twisted, all kind of, you know, trying to balance. Oh. I stopped just to let the pain subside. And I remember looking through a hole created by my elbow. And what I saw through that hole at a point where I was really down in life changed everything. What I saw was a guy called Ben. He was a, a young guy in his early 30s sitting in a really big wheelchair. He'd slipped over, hit his head whilst mopping his girlfriend's floor. He'd broken his neck, had no movement or feeling from his chest down and very little feeling in his arms or his hands. He was a quadriplegic. And I remember looking up at Ben and seeing Ben stare back at me. I was feeling sorry for myself at this point. Really, really bad place in life. The way Ben looked at me, I realized what he would have given for one chance at learning to roll over. And at that point, to say that I felt like the worst human on the face of the planet would be uh, an absolute understatement. And I remember being put back into the wheelchair and taken back to my ward and put back in bed. And I remember my body resting and my mind moving at a million miles an hour. I knew at that point that I needed to remember the way that I felt when I, when I looked at Ben. Because it was that feeling, whatever it was, and I couldn't explain it at the time, it was that feeling that was going to allow me to get through the hard days. And there were plenty of hard days on the horizon. So I decided to come up with a concept, which is a mindset toolbox, to take those moments and place them somewhere where I won't forget them. So my concept is so simple, very, very simple. It's that we're all born with an empty toolbox. It's really big. It has wheels, lots of drawers. We take it with us wherever we go in life. It, we, when we get it in the beginning, when we're born, it's empty. Our job in life is to fill that toolbox with tools that we can use to work through the challenges that we will all no doubt face. Adversity is simply a byproduct of breathing. So we fill that toolbox with tools, tools that we can use to navigate change, challenge, crisis, and adversity. It is our goal to learn how to find tools, uh, what, how to use them, and how to keep them sharp. Throughout that six months in hospital, 
the year and a half in rehab, the four and a half years up until this interview, I continue to find tools every day and place them in that toolbox. And I have a really big overflowing toolbox and it's my way to not forget the moments that I need to navigate my life. It's my way to provide a tangible uh, kind of learning experience in developing your mindset. And that's what this is. Life is one and lost above the shoulders. We have to go out and better ourselves. We have to go out and learn. We have all the information in the world at our fingertips. We have to understand that we have to build resiliency, ways of thinking uh, into our day-to-day life as an individual or an organization so that we can tackle our crucible moments, our tough days, you know, our tough years, our 2020s. We have to be wired that way. My mindset toolbox not only saved me, but it's now how I encourage others to think of their own mental uh, health and resilience. I want to hear a little bit about this mindset toolbox, but I want to go back for one second. Here you are trying to roll over, which for most of us is not, it's a pretty easy thing to do. It's like you just roll over. But for you at that point, it was, you know, might have said climb Mount Everest. I mean, it was pretty difficult. But then as you were going over and, you know, bad things were happening, and you looked at Ben, what was it about Ben's look that almost was a, um, not a mini crucible, but a, some, an inflection point in your recovery? There was something about Ben's look that kind of bore a hole through your soul almost. He was just a big boy sitting in that wheelchair and he had elastic bands around his wrist and he was moving his wrist in and out, maybe an inch or two at a time. And that was his exercise for the day. And knowing quadriplegia quite well by that point, just being in a spinal cord injury ward and learning about a spinal cord injury and what it does to your body. I knew what state Ben was in and I knew the very slim chance of him ever getting back to a point where I even was at that point at the beginning of my recovery. It was just the loss in his eyes. And we went on to talk a lot throughout the next six months in rehab and and learn more about each other and, you know, the struggles that we're both going through and, when I unpacked that moment with Ben into that mindset toolbox at the surface level, I obviously learned perspective. I was like, ah, you know, look, I am I'm actually quite lucky, you know, really at, at the surface level, but by unpacking that story into my mindset toolbox, that was a process that allowed me to pull so much more out of that moment than what I, I found at first glance. And that's the power of the toolbox. I learned so many things from gratitude through to uh, accepting what I had and my ability as opposed to focusing on what I'd lost. All of these different lessons from Ben, they all boiled down to one thing. I was lucky to be a paraplegic. I was 21 years old. I just survived a plane crash. I just turned 21. I'd been in hospital for not an entirely long amount of time. And I could look at you and tell you that I was lucky to be a paraplegic. I could look at you and tell you that this challenge was not physical. It was mental. Without Ben's injection of gratitude that day, without the concept of the mindset toolbox, I would not. And I just would not be where I am today. I just wouldn't. That's amazing. And that, so that's really one of the key elements of your toolbox, uh, gratitude, confidence, resiliency. Obviously you can connect the dots now in hindsight, a sense of gratitude that I'm glad I'm not where Ben is, you know? Uh, yeah. hundred percent. Ben would yeah. give, as you said, anything he could to be where, where Ryan was, you know? Um, so talk about how you use this toolbox to inspire others, both others who've been through physical challenges that could be, you know, mental, uh, physical, uh, financial abuse. I mean, there's all sorts of challenges in the world. So talk about how this can help not just, you know, crash survivors or paraplegics, but just people in general. What about this toolbox can really help people? I encourage anyone who has a pulse to build their own mindset toolbox because it doesn't matter where we live, the color of your skin, uh, your background, religion, beliefs, you know, geographic, like it just doesn't matter. If you are breathing right now, you will have experienced adversity in your life and you will experience it more again, byproduct of breathing. So adversity is a common thread amongst every human on the planet. I encourage everyone to pull together their own mindset toolbox to take the moments in their life and convert them to tools to build resiliency and confidence in their ability to overcome. 
I did find, however, as I filled this mindset toolbox, that even in a time of crisis, a really rough moment, even with a, a full toolbox, it's hard to reach back into that toolbox and pull out exactly the right tool you need to overcome that challenge. Whether it's an engine failure in that split second moment, whether you've just been furloughed, whether you've just found out that someone's been lost within a family or any form of adversity, big or small, we are so overwhelmed when it first strikes. I wanted to create a checklist that we could run through very quickly and very simply whenever that moment strikes. Now, I use my three favorite tools and most used tools out of my mindset toolbox to create that uh, checklist. People often ask, why a checklist? Why, why did you do that? Well, as a pilot, when something goes wrong in an airplane, when a red light flashes or a warning buzzer sounds, we don't just start pressing random buttons and pulling random levers, despite what Hollywood may tell you. We use a checklist, <laughs> right? We go through a checklist of predetermined potential problems. We work through the checklist items and we hopefully end at what is a solution to the problem. So I created a checklist, not for aviation, but for life a simple three-step checklist that will not solve all your problems. If I knew the uh, checklist to solve all of the problems in the world, I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd be on my yacht in the Caribbean <laughs> drinking some form of alcohol. But this is a checklist that places you in a more change and challenge ready mindset. It is so simple. It's gratitude, confidence, and resilience. And we can either go through that or, or we, we don't have to with timing, but that three-step checklist is a very quick, easy I'm, I'm way to curious, implement least, my tools. At least in summary, why those three? Right, because they were my three favorite tools, Warwick. It is simple okay. as that. You know, like <laughs> okay. Everything I'd been through, everything I had, when I built that mindset toolbox, I didn't just fill it from that day on. I went back to the round the world flight and I unpacked stories, stories that we share in, in keynotes you know, around America and around the world. We took stories that I had put in my you know, past folder, we pulled them out and we unpacked them. And I learned more and more from the experiences I'd already been through. So the, these three tools in this checklist are simply my most used, most transformational uh, tools that have changed my life. And not only do I want other people to potentially implement my three-step checklist, but I want you to understand the power of a checklist culture and start to create your own, you know, grab your own mindset toolbox, go through the same process, fill it, you know, look at your top tools that you use every day, look at the challenges you face, start to put together little checklists that you can implement when times are tough, because, you know, this year's a tough year, and we all need the, the mental resiliency to kind of bounce back. And I find that fascinating, because you're saying, by all means, use gratitude, confidence, resilience, but you're saying, you know, make sure that it works for you, develop your own, which is sort of a a different approach. You could say, this is the three steps, guarantee it'll work for everybody, but you're saying it might work for a bunch, but here's what I've done just so that you can get an idea what it looks like, but create your own. That's, that's a different approach. That's almost feels um, empowering to people rather than saying, you got to use this or else. So you no, get, we don't want the cookie cutter approach. It just doesn't work in life. It just doesn't, you know, like we're right. not the same. We're all different. I remember having a lady say to me after a keynote, oh, the checklist won't work. She said, lists don't work for me. She said, I write a list. I never get through that list. And I know a lot of people like that. Yeah. And my pilot brain thinks, why? You know, like this is the best <laughs> thing in the world, but this didn't work for this lady. So I, I told her, we worked together and I said, let's take one step back. A checklist is a systematic approach, a, uh, a an implementable way that we can just you know, apply whatever it is over and over again. Let's create your systematic approach. So what do you enjoy? It could be a walk on the beach. Every time you struggle or you have a rough day, take your shoes off, get your feet in the sand and go for a stroll, you know, watch the sunset. You know, it could be anything. It could be the gym. It could be, it doesn't matter. We have to find our own little uh, solutions to those moments of struggle and, and change. Every time we go through crucibles or every time we go through, you know, adversity or have a rough day, we've got to have tools in that toolbox that we can apply immediately. So that, that is a, I'm sorry, Warwick, go ahead. I'm I was going to say, uh, as we kind of wrap up, one of the maybe last question I have is, um, you know, how does life look for Ryan Campbell now? These several years later, you've been through a lot. You're doing a lot of amazing things. How would you describe to people what's Ryan Campbell's life like now? Ryan Campbell lives 
conveniently close to the Jack Daniels distillery in Tennessee. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's where. <laughs> no, it's um, I. You know, a lot of people wonder how my life went after the accident. I went back to walking, and as I said, I do walk very. Got a lot of things still wrong with me. I found my way back into the air, flying airplanes with modified brake systems. But then I went as an incomplete paraplegic. I learned to fly a helicopter from scratch and now have a commercial helicopter license. My goal was to fly helicopters full time. I was flying a helicopter one day. I had a rock in my shoe. I can't feel my feet. And that rock ate into my foot. So I ended up back in hospital, back in my wheelchair for two months. That was my moment where I went, okay, we have to do more with these stories. We have to go out and help others who have been through similar things to me. I sold everything except a little airplane that got me back into the sky named Doug and Doug and I moved to Tennessee and I now live in the U S as a professional keynote speaker, uh, working with organizations from school groups to fortune 500s and delivering sessions from eight minutes to 90 minutes on, uh, navigating uh, change, overcoming adversity and, and using our challenges in life to build a better future. And uh, it is my passion. It's my drive. And I just find it unbelievably rewarding. So it's a pleasure to help others learn. And it's a pleasure to learn along the way. That is an excellent segue to um, our, and I always say this as Warwick pointed out before we started recording, I always say this on every show, it's time to land the plane, but this really makes sense, you know, talking to you, Ryan, it's, We've, we've come to the point in the show where it's time to land the plane. Uh, but one thing I'd be remiss if I did not, based on what you just said, for sure, and, and everything that we've talked about, if I didn't give you the chance to let people know how to find you and how to find your services uh, online and elsewhere. Absolutely. So we, we would love to help anyone and everyone. And 2020 is rough. And we do a multi-camera virtual uh, you know, uh, keynote we've delivered this week to all sorts of large companies. Uh, you can find our details on all social medias at Ryan Campbell speaking, or you can find me and contact uh, our team directly at ryancampbell.co. It's not .com. I cannot afford the M yet. It's www.ryancampbell.co. So reach out to us. We'd love to chat. We'd love to help. Um, before I close, uh, we have with every guest that we have on the show, we, we have a little form that we ask people to fill out. And, you know, sometimes the question, the answers are really interesting and sometimes they're less interesting. And you gave an, an answer. I got to know our, what the answer to this question that you asked. We, we have on our form is if there's only one question we could ask you, what would you want it to be? And this is what you said we should ask you. So I'm going to ask you this and, and see what the answer is. You said we should ask you, what is the most unique purchase you've ever made? Gary, when I moved to America... I got in the car and I drove to Gracelands in Memphis to Elvis's place. Mm -hmm. I went into the gift shop and I bought a model pink Cadillac. It was always my dream to own a pink Cadillac. And I spent about $30 and I bought this small model pink Cadillac that sits by my television. Four months later, the opportunity arose to buy a real pink Cadillac. So I now own a wow. two and a half ton 1960 uh, pink Cadillac with white leather interior that we drive to Kroger. We drive it to the movie theater. We take it everywhere. Uh, we just, I've never seen a machine in my life that brings so many smiles uh, as what flow our pink Cadillac does. It, it led to a whole segment that we do called what's your pink Cadillac. What's the one thing you buy? It's absolutely ridiculous. It just makes you feel like a kid and, you know, absolutely illogical. But um, my favorite, uh, ridiculous purchase in my life has been a genuine Elvis 1960 pink Cadillac. Wow. I will. Uh, that beats mine. Mine is a seven foot tall Superman action figure in my office. So. That is insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you uh, for being with us. And um, as we do, when we end listener, uh, there's uh, much great content here, but three things uh, sort of takeaways that you can take with you as you, as you go from our, our conversation with Ryan one um, and he started talking about that from the outset when he was six years old and that is pay attention to your passions at a young age. Not everyone who dreams of being a firefighter or a nurse as a child ends up doing so, but they can. Uh, Ryan's story is a testament to the truth that the passion of your childhood can be the vision of your adulthood. If you love it, you can learn it and you can live it at any age, like Ryan did, a, a great help to making that happen is to find support and to seek mentors 
and then go for it. A second takeaway, I think, is that we find the tools in our low points to power better times. That's something Ryan said um, in a conversation we had before this episode. Crucibles are painful emotionally, financially, sometimes like Ryan's physically. And there comes a time, as a friend of Ryan's told him after his plane crash, that we have to decide to sink or swim. So start swimming one stroke at a time. You will get to a better destination than sinking. And the third point um, that we've spent the really good dialogue here at the end talking about is build a toolbox to help you uh, as you go through your crucible and fill it with the thoughts and practices that will help you navigate the steps you need to take to move beyond that crucible. Focus on filling that toolbox with items that build your gratitude, your confidence, and your resilience. Ryan um, says that life is won and lost above the shoulders. We would only add from crucible leadership to that by saying that crucibles are overcome and a life of significance is launched above the shoulders. So until next time we're together, listeners, thank you for spending time with us in this episode of Beyond the Crucible. Uh, and please remember, as Ryan's uh, beautiful story uh, makes very clear, that your crucible experiences can be painful in a lot of ways, emotionally, financially, to your dreams, to your body. They can be very painful, but they are not the end of your story. Ryan's crucible was not the end of his story. Your crucibles can, in fact, be the beginning of a new chapter in your story, as they have been for Ryan. And that chapter can be, as it has been for Ryan, um, the best chapter of all, because what it leads to, the path it puts you on, is toward a life of significance.